Hi, good evening, and welcome to the Parkland College Town Hall. Uh, I'm Stephanie Stewart, the Vice President for Communications and External Affairs, and I'll help to facilitate our question and answer session this evening. Uh, so tonight we'll be answering some of the most frequently asked questions uh, that we've been receiving over the last few weeks and uh, in the coming days as we um, approach the fall semester. And uh, we will talk with a few of our experts here at Parkland College uh, to answer those questions for you. Uh, so this session is for students, parents, and community, uh, community members specifically who are wanting to know more about the fall semester, what it will look like at Parkland as we safely welcome students back to campus. And so I will uh, do a quick introduction of our panelists for this evening. They will be Dr. Thomas Ramich, President of Parkland College, Dr. Pamela Lau, Executive Vice President, Mike Tramey, Vice President for Student Services, Dr. Nancy Sutton, Associate Vice President for Academic Services, Dr. Marietta Turner, Dean of Students, Kristen Smigelski, Dean of Enrollment Management, Dr. Suzanne Jones, Dean of Counseling Services, and Dr. Amy Penny, Director of Professional Development and Instructional Technology, or PDIT, here at Parkland. So thank you all for participating. Um, and before we get started, I would like to invite Dr. Ramage and Dr. Lau to give some opening remarks. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ramage. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, Tom Ramage. I'm the president at Parkland. I've been here for about 22 years, maybe the last 13 or so as president. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Thank you each for joining us, uh, all the students, prospective students, parents, uh, maybe people who are wondering what to do, how to get involved at Parkland College. Let me tell you, uh, there's still time. <clears throat> we have uh, classes starting on August 24th, so if you have not yet registered or not yet gotten into the system, the good news is there's still time, but there's not much left, so you need to get going. Uh, obviously, this semester is going to be a little bit different uh, than previous semesters. Things are going on in the world that make our uh, ability to have regular classes somewhat difficult. Fortunately, we've been preparing that for that uh, this day for quite a while. Uh, getting our campus ready, figuring out what we need to do to our campus. We've been working with uh, the Department of Public Health, uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, other colleges, and a variety of other working groups to help us prepare uh, for opening the college safely on August 24th. The good news, the campus is ready. Uh, we have um, protections in place. We have plexiglass screens up. We have hand sanitizer. We have markers on the floor to help you with social distancing. We are going to ask you to help us, though. Uh, we want you to be masked when you come to campus. We will be masked, and we would hope that you would be, too. Well, we'll kind of insist on it. Uh, social distancing is a thing here. We've adjusted our classrooms to accommodate smaller numbers of students to keep that distance between students and the faculty and staff that's so important. Uh, we take it very, very seriously. Uh, our physical plant is ready to help clean those classrooms, those desks, those computer monitors and keyboards each day or, or uh, more often than that if it's at all possible uh, to make sure that you have a safe and productive semester. So we've organized a whole bunch of people to help answer your questions today. This is going to be the most fascinating night of sort of like television that you'll experience in a long time, right? So kick your feet up, get those questions submitted, and we'll get right to you. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Lau. All right, Dr. Lau, it Go ahead and unmute yourself if you would. As fall semester is around the corner and we are very, very excited to welcome new students to Parkland as well as to welcome back continuing students. As Dr. Ramage has said, we all have many questions about what fall semester will be like in the middle of this worldwide pandemic. And tonight our town hall panelists will address many of these issues. I just want to let you know that here at Parkland, especially the faculty have been very busy this summer. They've been planning carefully, very creatively to ensure that the quality of instruction that we are known for will continue despite the pandemic while we observe the CDC protocol so that we can keep everyone, students, faculty and staff, that we can keep everyone safe and well. I just want to reiterate that your decision to attend Parkland is an excellent one. And we're all here to help you turn that decision into a wonderful journey of learning, of self-discovery, and of good preparation for what lies ahead for you in your future. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Lau. And so with that, we're going to transition into our question and answer portion. And many of you who are tuning in, you may have actually sent in some questions over the past few days. We've asked for, um, asked for those questions in advance and we've created really some common themes. And so you'll see, um, see those um, coming into the questions we ask of our panelists. And of course, you're welcome to ask in the Q&A feature um, questions that you might have and we may um, answer it uh, within the live stream or we may catch up with you after uh, the live stream as well, get a little bit more information so we can answer your specific question. Um, and so I will actually ask my uh, first question of Dr. Sutton. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us in a little more detail what fall classes will look like um, and how students will know the specifics of what's expected in their classes. I'd be happy to answer that for you and for everyone out there. So we are hoping to achieve some element of normalcy at a time when things aren't all that normal. We have three goals this semester. One is to maintain the health and safety of all our students and our faculty and staff. Another is to maintain the continuity of the educational uh, programs that we offer. And the third is to try and provide that ever important engagement between students and faculty. In order to do that, there are certain types of uh, delivery modes that we've adopted for this semester. The trick for you is to know how to read your section code. So when you register for a class or when you're looking at classes and trying to decide what class you want to take, there's the three letters that tell you what, what the discipline is, like bio. There are num three numbers that tell you what the course number is. And then there's another three numbers that tell you the section number. What you want to look for is a letter code after that section number. And if you see a W, that means your class is totally online, and it means that you choose the time that you want to take it. You'll interact with your instructor through discussion posts, through online office hours, through email questions. You'll have the same interaction, but you'll choose the time that you work on your class so you can fit that to your life. If your section code is a V, it means you've chosen an online section that is synchronous, which means everybody gets online at the same time. So there's a certain time of day that you will be online and you will meet your instructor and all your classmates at the same time. So obviously to, to take W's and V's, you wanna make sure that you have an internet connection and the technology that you need to do that. But if you're a student who would like to have a little bit of time on campus, then you wanna look for either no code whatsoever. If there is no letter code, that means that section is totally on campus. There's just a few of those that are in their career areas. And the faculty are working very hard to make sure that they've determined how many students can be in a space at one time, that they're handling the distancing, but that they're providing the hands-on experience that students need. An example of a class like that would be welding. A little hard to do welding online, so our faculty are working very hard to make sure that they can teach welding in a safe environment. If you see an F code, that's the newest delivery mode we have. And that means your faculty have chosen to give you the option of how you want to attend. That's a flexible course. The faculty member will teach at a certain time. Some students will attend on campus. Some students will attend synchronously online at the same time. And other students may choose to catch up with the lectures and do the work totally online at their own pace. That one gives a lot of flexibility. You'll see a few sections like that using it. Our faculty have worked very hard to try to develop those to, to give students the opportunity to blend their education with their life, especially during these times. The most you'll see is an H, and that's a, that's a hybrid. And a hybrid means you'll have some on campus and some online. How much you have on campus will depend on the discipline and the individual instructor. Science labs, health professions, a lot of the career areas, they'll have a lot more on campus because they need the hands-on. But the faculty will have put as much online as they can to give as much flexibility and to make the most of the littlest amount on campus that they can get away with. Because we're trying for safety, but we also want you to have that interaction. So the first thing you do is you look for that section code. And the next thing you do is you count on your instructor to contact you. All of the faculty will be reaching out to the students registered in their sections sometime before the class starts to give them information on who's going to come to campus when and how you're going to approach the class. 
And don't worry if you don't quite understand how it's all going to work. We're all gonna to learn together that first week and we're here to help you make sure that you are where you need to be and your faculty are prepared to be very flexible about this. Our goal is to make sure that everyone has the opportunities they want, and that the educational experience is a good one, but that we stay as safe as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Sutton. Yeah, those codes, I, uh, I didn't realize that. So I think that's really helpful for students to be able to uh, to decide, hey, is this going to be a good fit for me? Because there are so many different situations out there, especially with everything going on. So that's a good uh, tip, I suppose, for students selecting courses. Um, and Dr. Penny, I really wanted to lodge the next question for you, which is about how faculty have been preparing for all of these different modes of teaching. So tell us a little bit about the work that's gone on to prepare for this fall and how it might be a little bit different even in the spring when we went entirely online very, very quickly. Yeah, well, like everybody, we had to learn in the deep end, um, but that learning and that creativity, which I think you hear a little bit from what Dr. Sutton was saying about the codes for different classes, there's hybrids, there's flexible, and that's going to sound confusing to you, but your, your teachers will know what they're doing. So they'll get in touch with you to let you know, okay, this is how the schedule is going to lay out for the bulk of the semester. Uh, obviously, we're all being very flexible with that, but the creativity really started in spring when we got thrown into the deep end we created some courses over the summer for our own faculty and we've had over 150 faculty go through those courses to really change what we even think of as um, a hybrid delivery face-to-face -face delivery um, so some of the communication tools are, are new that we're using uh, and then we have a lot of new and innovative faculty uh, working on uh, you know creative ways to balance communication, how the curriculum is delivered, and then of course how uh, any face-to-face -face will happen. And so I think what you're going to see is, for instance, uh, Christina Beatty, one of our chemistry teachers, uh, really mastered very quickly how to help students uh, chat with her over in, in Teams, which all students will get as part of uh, the Microsoft Outlook, um, and then how to meet together on platforms like Zoom, and then really some unique ways that even the discussion posts and other group activities are interconnected. We were able to learn to do that over the summer. And so I think what you'll see uh, in fall uh, is a lot of prepared faculty, a lot of faculty excited to, to try out some new things, new ways to use communication. Uh, and that's gonna be the most important thing that I think students will notice this fall that's different is you, you might have even more communication with your faculty member than you would have say a year ago um, you know, everybody just sort of uses the tools they use, but now that we know how to do different things, you may have even a little bit more access and at different hours, not saying like at 3 a.m. or anything, but you might see that you have actually a little bit more face-to-face -face time with faculty uh, because of the creativity and the new tools that we've been able to utilize. Yeah, that's a great point about that um, kind of continuous availability that is, a, you know, an option now that we're all utilizing these online tools. So I think that really has been a shift. Um, Dr. Sutton, you mentioned um, welding, for example, is a great, great example of a, a course that will still take place in person, but using the safety protocols. But there are other CTE courses that have historically been all in person, maybe automotive is an example or other areas, um, but they're moving to hybrid formats. And so what does that look like in a career area where it's traditionally been hands-on? Well, as Dr. Penny mentioned, a lot of faculty took the opportunity to learn new things. And so, yes, in a lot of our career courses and in health professions, there might not have been as much online education before because it is hands-on. You do have to be in the lab working and learning. But now the faculty have done things like spent the summer with the GoPro and have made videos of close-ups of how you do things, teaching the, the theory and the concepts of whether it's in manufacturing or whether it's in automotive, and then those can be uploaded. Students can learn the concepts online, and then when they do come to campus, they focus immediately on the hands-on activity so that it makes it easier for us to split them into smaller groups to, instead of having the full class there all the time, half the class comes at certain times, the other half at another time, or they can rotate through different areas because they've gathered and gained the concepts earlier. So there's been a lot of um, excitement even among the faculty to suddenly use some of this technology. We've set up mobile carts where they can actually move them from room to room and allow them to 
show what they're doing in the classroom to the students that are there, but also to the students who are attending synchronously online at the same time and record the session so that other students who maybe couldn't attend because they were taking care of, of family or they were had a job they had to work and they couldn't make it at the same time. So it's really opened up a lot of possibilities and let the faculty think about what is it I teach that could be done online that would better prepare the student to come in and actually really get to work in the lab area. You see the same thing in the chemistry labs. Um, it, Amy mentioned the chemistry, chemistry and biology, they're splitting the students, maybe half will be in the lab at one time, the other half may be in another room working on something else or will come in at a different time. There's a lot of work that's gone into to really separating out how, how are the different ways that you can learn this. So there's a lot of new things and I think, um, I, as, as Amy said, I think it's going, to, uh, it's going to get students a little more excited too because it lets them look at the discipline in a new way. No, that's really important to think about. And it's really impressive the work that uh, our faculty have done over the past few months. And it's really been exciting to see all the innovative new strategies they're using in their different content areas um, as well. So we're gonna shift a little bit to students and expectations of students um, in, uh, as we return to campus. And so I'll, um, I'll lodge this question with uh, Dean Marietta Turner. She's our Dean of Students. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what the expectation will be around masks and social distancing as students return to campus. Sure, Stephanie, my pleasure. As Dr. Ramitz pointed out, we're going to require the mask in every effort to meet the expectations of the executive order from the governor and the Illinois Department of Public Health to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. All employees, students, and visitors will be required to wear face covering whenever they come to a campus. And that includes whether they're going to another facility for a internship or a clinical, where they're traveling between the buildings, they must keep that mask on. And I like to put it this way, the minute they step out of the car or step off the bus, it should be put on and it doesn't come off until one leaves the campus. It's important for people to realize that we want people to be comfortable. So we're suggesting that people use the mask of their choice, whether it's cloth or disposable. Um, people have different kinds of fabric that they like, or it could be a different style, such as a cowl neck that they pull up or a gaiter, but it must be a fast face mask that covers their nose and mouth securely. Plastic face shields are not okay. They are not meeting the requirement and they will not be allowed. So we want people to be comfortable. So wearing what they're used to wearing is important and we are going to allow that. In terms of social distancing, we are saying that six feet is the expectation and we are putting signage up to remind people of that. As they've said earlier, classrooms are being designed and officers are being designed so that people can maintain those distances and also we're putting visual cues on the floor to help people. The goal here, keep everyone healthy and safe. Great. No, it's really good to know about those face shields, too. I think we've gotten a lot of questions about if that is an acceptable face covering. Um, and so it's great to get that information out there right away. Um, if you're planning on wearing it, that you know you do need to bring a cloth mask or something to cover that um, the nose and the mouth. Um, and so Vice President uh, Mike Tramey, uh, he's our uh, Vice President for Student Services and um, is really spearheading a lot of the communication that we're doing, that critical communication leading up to the semester with our students. So how will all of these uh, different pieces be communicated to students? Because I know that there's a, lot, um, there's a lot to digest and just be aware of before you come. Yeah, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Great, great question. So um, first and foremost, if you haven't seen it yet, um, or, or visited it a while ago, we have an FAQ page up on our website that we have um, stocked, uh, especially recently with a lot of new updates and a lot of new information about um, all of these different concepts that we're talking about tonight. Uh, and, and we'll continue to update by that mechanism. So I would encourage all, um, all visitors, all students um, to really explore that FAQ page and continue to explore it for updates as the semester goes. As we learn new things and, and um, develop new processes and protocols, that will be one of our primary um, communication methods. Another communication method for, for all students 
um, and one of our primaries in getting uh, all kinds of information out, not, not just uh, related to COVID-19, is your email. So as a student at Parkland, the expectation is that you are checking your email on a daily basis and, and reading those emails and, and heeding um, the, the information that's given to you in those emails. So that email communication will be vital. Next week, we will start with some daily messages. For those of you who are continuing students, you'll remember that from back in the spring where you got an email from me almost on a daily basis with different um, safety protocols or information about services on campuses or process and procedures. Um, that will start up again late next week and will continue um, for, for at least a good ways into the semester uh, with that kind of daily information. You will also get an email from our COVID-19 team on a daily basis um, with regards to symptom checking. And we'll talk more about that, that symptom checking uh, later on, but, um, but you'll get daily emails uh, from that department as well. Um, we're also going to have um, more signage than you could ever imagine around campus so that you can't help but be reminded of the things that, that we've um, tried to communicate with you from the moment you step out of the car, as you walk up the walkways, you'll see signs talking about symptom checking and mask wearing and, and social distancing and the like, um, all the way through every door, in every hallway, in every classroom. Um, you, you, will, you will hopefully uh, never be at a point where you can't see some of the signs to remind you about uh, the things that we're asking you for. Um, and I think that really is the, the majority of that communication plan. We will also leverage um, uh, other modalities, uh, your COBRA accounts, um, your uh, My Parkland will also have some messaging included in that. And so all of those avenues will be used to communicate uh, with our student body about that piece. Um, just want to add one more communication piece in, and, and Dean Turner may reference it a little more later, but you'll also be getting communication from a lot of special offices. One I mentioned earlier, which is our, our wellness coordinator and our wellness team. You'll be getting some, some important communications, especially by email um, from, from Sarah Maxwell, who is our wellness coordinator on that piece, and then Dean Turner, who will communicate on a very frequent basis, especially as it relates to absences. Uh, and those things, and, and she may talk more about that uh, later on. But, but so a lot of that communication um, will be given to you in several modalities, so hopefully we don't miss anybody and, and we get everyone the information they need to be safe and successful this semester. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, some good reminders about the Wellness Center. It's been a, an interesting year and lots of uh, good information to be accessed through the Wellness Center. So. Um, so, Dr. Sutton, so we've, we've read uh, Mike Tramey's emails, we've worn our mask to campus, and we've been bombarded with the signage, and we're well aware of the protocols um, on our way in. But tell us, logistically, what happens in the classroom um, in order to follow all these distancing protocols and ensure safety? Well, the first thing you need to know is that all our rooms have been measured and marked. So we have gone in and we have verified how many students an instructor can, can fit in any one classroom, providing the six feet of distance in every direction. And we've uh, identified where the desk or the chair and table should be. We've removed all the extra furniture so people will be able to visually see what six feet is and instructors will have their area and people can feel confident that they're not going to, to be crowded in. Many of our classrooms used to be pretty packed with, with uh, desks. Well, we've reduced that number and that's where the faculty will be identifying how many of their class are on campus at any one time. We will have hand sanitizer in every classroom. We will have cleaning supplies for cleaning surfaces. That can be done as often as it needs to be done. As Dr. Ramage said earlier, all the rooms will be cleaned on a daily basis. We encourage the students and the faculty to avoid the use of shared materials as might have been done in the past. So faculty are working very hard to reduce that as much as possible. In some curriculum, you will always have certain things that where you have to share materials. That's the nature of some of the activities. Faculty know that they will do everything they can to reduce those instances and to keep them as safe as possible. The masks become a big thing again. We can't stress this enough. You'll need that mask before you enter the classroom. If you don't have the mask when you come to the classroom door, if you had one and you lost it or it broke, 
you'll be directed to an office where you can get another a disposable mask and then you can go back to the room and you'll be allowed in the room once you have the mask if during the class period you feel the need to remove the mask your instructor would expect you to leave the room if you need to do that and then come back into the room when you're ready to have the mask on again we want to keep everybody safe we want to keep everybody calm about what is going on so we need everybody to be really respectful of the fact that the mask is really just as it's for everybody else it isn't just for you so we need to understand that and so we'll have every opportunity to give people the break if they need to and faculty are aware of this um, the the last thing really to to stress again is the the distancing that when you're in the room that you maintain the distance you don't move the furniture around probably won't have group work exactly like you used to so for a lot of people that may be a blessing but uh, the faculty are working very hard to make this work to make people feel comfortable so that they can focus on the education and not worry so much about the virus yeah i think that really helps to kind of paint a picture of what it'll be like and if students need a break that maybe that is an option um, if they're there for an extended period of time um, dr jones you're our dean of counseling services and um, there are some situations where students can't or they just wouldn't want to wear a mask in a classroom setting. Um, and so talk us through, um, from your perspective, um, what options are in place for those students? Thank you, Stephanie. It's a good question. Um, as we've been saying, the theme tonight is safety. Um, the mask is required, so there's no exception. Uh, we, we have to wear our masks. Now, saying that, we do recognize there are students who may have medical issues or concerns that pose challenges to wear a mask. Um, if that's the situation or the case, students can contact our Accessibility Services Office. Um, they are prepared. They are ready to work with students and discuss uh, what is needed. Uh, for example, medical documentation would be needed. Then they would have conversations to talk about what are some of those options. Some of those options could be uh, working with faculty. Maybe some of the classes are completely online. I'll uh, refer back to Dr. Turner who talked about um, different face coverings. So maybe we talk about what are the face coverings you use when you go out in public to the store or go shopping. So we look at those options of, of what they're wearing uh, as an accommodation. Uh, but no matter what, our accessibility services team is ready to help. So they're prepared, they're ready. We help all students with their needs. We'll have those conversations and no matter what, we're here together uh, to help them through that. Now, that's really good to know there are some resources if a student has a unique situation that they wanna talk through and strategize around um, as we enter the fall semester. Um, so Vice President Tramey, what, um, you know, I think probably one of the top questions that we've gotten all together is around uh, positive cases testing um, and what the protocols are for things like notification. Um, so how are we going to manage that into the fall semester um, when we know that there is there is a some level of, of community spread of the virus? Yeah, great, great question, Stephanie. Yeah, that has been a, a, um, a hot topic out there in the news media lately as U of I has announced some of its um, world-class research in the area and some opportunities that they may be able to um, share with their larger community and, and uh, frankly, folks around the country uh, at some point after, after some logistical and, and governmental hurdles are, are climbed on their end. Um, unfortunately, we're not to that point yet um, where they can make that uh, more widely accessible outside of their campus community. So, so we have some safety protocols and have been working all spring and summer long very closely with a group um, of government agencies and uh, healthcare providers, the local healthcare providers, um, the university, ourselves, some, some labor and industry folks, as well as uh, the emergency personnel in the area to develop a plan um, until that happens. And we're very comfortable and confident with that plan. We have a community that is rich in um, healthcare options and has served the, the testing needs of our community very, very well, along with the state testing a site out at Marketplace Mall, um, to the point where our positivity rate in the Champaign County area is one of the lowest in the state. And, and um, so, so those plans and, and the hard work of those groups that we've been active and, and uh, in an active and important role in um, have been working. And so our goal is to continue 
that kind of work and collaboration across the governmental and, and healthcare sectors in our community, um, refer our faculty and staff and students um, to those testing sites now to uh, get those resources that are available to them. And then when, if and when partnerships um, are available to us in, in other entities, uh, be at the university or elsewhere, we will certainly explore those and get those uh, in place as soon as we can. So, so the, sh the long answer to that question is, is, are we testing on our campus in the same way that U of I is? No, right, not right now, but we're doing uh, everything within the community resource um, to, to work with those partners to make that testing uh, available in its current form um, to all members of our campus and, and larger community. Um, if, a, if a positive case happens on campus, I think Stephanie referenced that, what's the protocol and that undoubtedly will happen in, in any community um, the size of Parkland College. Um, you're gonna have a, a positive case at times. So our protocol at that point is, a, is to draw on the strength of our relationship with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health Department and um, we will be in immediate contact with them and leverage their protocols and their contact tracing resources um, to help us navigate that with our student body and, and our employee uh, groupings of faculty and staff. Um, we have a team built on campus that will be led by Sarah Maxwell, our wellness coordinator, that will initiate and, and do a lot of that behind the scenes work in conjunction with Champaign-Urbana Public Health and so you may get contacted at times uh, by that group on our campus to find out what, if any, impact uh, your contact has been uh, with a, a person that has been reported as a positive case. And so please cooperate with that for the, the health and safety of you and, and, and your loved ones, um, but also with the, those around you and, and the wider campus community. Um, that cooperation and contact tracing is vital in our attempts to keep everyone safe. And so we asked for good cooperation and, and collegiality with that team when, um, when those positive cases do surface. So I think, uh, I think that really is, is how our, our plans will work. Um, that contact, I will just say from our, our wellness center team and our contact tracing team will likely come in one of two ways. It will come in emails directly to those people who they need to speak with, um, and it will come in phone calls with our most accurate um, contact information. So we will be shipping some emails out to our entire student body, asking them to update their contact information with us to make sure if it's been a while since you were admitted to the college or um, you may have switched uh, addresses or phone numbers since you were admitted, that we have your most active um, and, and uh, the contact information that's gonna allow us to get in touch with you um, in the most expedient manner so that we can begin those contact tracing uh, components and keep you safe should that need arise. Yeah, that's really helpful information, especially around the positive cases and how we'll be uh, working on that. And I sit on some of those countywide committees as well, and our communities really come together uh, to create some protocols that we're all following uh, related to those positive tests. So thank you, Mike. Um, Kristen Smigelski, our Dean of Enrollment Management, switching gears a little bit to the enrollment process, which for some students may still be ahead of them if they're uh, still considering coming to Parkland this fall. Um, so Dean Smigelski, can you share a little bit about um, what the enrollment process looks like um, during this time? Because I know that there have been some rapid changes, but that we still have all the, all the parts and pieces to the process uh, set up for students. Yes, absolutely. Um, and yes, there is still time to register for fall, but now is definitely the time because the start of fall um, is right around the corner of August 24th, um, approaching very quickly. Uh, we have, uh, we are here to serve students and however they're, they're most comfortable. Um, you may call or email our office. Um, we can touch base with somebody personally and we can walk you through the um, admissions process or talk about your next steps for enrollment. Um, so you kind of know where you stand in the enrollment pipeline and we'll give you your next step. Um, you may also participate in our enrollment blitz event. We are excited that we just launched it today um, and it takes place the rest of this week as well as next week. And we have two options this year. So you can come to campus. Um, and what's nice is that all of our enrollment services offices are centrally located here in the U-Wing. So if you just come to the U-Wing, um, you'll be greeted at the, on the first floor by our admissions table kind of figure out what you're here to do um, and some of the questions that you have and then as needed 
you can visit the enrollment offices to get other questions answered and to eventually you know, register for classes. Um, if you prefer virtual, we have a public Zoom link um, available. And if you visit parkland.edu slash register, you will see that link there. Um, that link is accessible between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And all you have to do is log on and staff will be there to greet you. Um, we have virtual rooms set up so we can send you from room to room depending upon which questions you have. And again, that's all one-on-one -on -one, um, personalized attention as well. So if you prefer to not come to campus to complete your enrollment, um, check out that Zoom link. Again, that's parkland.edu slash register and we'll be ready to assist you there. Um, for those of you that have not applied yet um, or are still in the application process, our fall application is still open. Uh, we make applying easy, it's all online. And uh, once you fill out the application, if you're applying as a degree seeking student, we would need a transcript, um, but that's very quick and easy. We can get you admitted. And then again, go through the enrollment steps um, as I talked about getting in touch with our offices either in person um, or virtual. So lots of ways to, to be involved and, and complete your next steps for enrollment. Thanks, Kristen. It sounds like you guys have really streamlined the process and made all the parts and pieces happen uh, virtually, which is really wonderful. And one of the, the next steps after you're an admitted student is to, uh, to meet with a counselor or advisor um, to help you enroll in your classes and create a plan. So uh, Dr. Jones, can you share a little bit about how students will access those services this fall? Sure. And just to reiterate, it's not too late to enroll. So we're here for you and we're ready. So uh, please do so. Um, we have many ways too that students can connect with us. Um, and we've been doing this since March as well. So we're pretty good at it. Um, there's one option when you're ready to register and enroll. You can go to Parkland's website and under academic advising, we have very detailed steps um, how to make an appointment. We use an online booking tool, well, scheduling tool called Bookings. So that way students can make their own appointments based on what's available for them. And if they have a regular advisor they meet with, um, they can choose that person as well. Another way to talk with an advisor or make an appointment is to call our counseling center um, or email us at counselingservices at parkland.edu. Uh, once you make a bookings appointment, students will get an email confirmation with a link. So you're going to hear the term Microsoft Teams quite a bit. Um, so it's a great platform. It's a secure place for face-to-face -face meetings. And so that's what our advisors do. So they will share screens with you, um, help with academic planning um, to help you, you know, with your next steps at Parkland. Uh, with that, we do have uh, some staff on campus. We do have advisors and counselors on campus based on availability. And to find out about that availability, it's the best to, you know, call our center for counseling services. Um, Parkland is very concerned about everyone's overall emotional health during all of this. And so I do want to stress, we have free counseling at Parkland. We have um, seasoned counselors, professional counselors that are here to help our students during this time where, you know, students are feeling anxious, overwhelmed, uh, you know, gosh, I'm a little scared coming back to campus or going back to school or what happens next if, you know, we do this and things change again and I've got family and jobs and you know, where do I go? So that, that's overwhelming. So we do have services for that. We have free counseling. Um, and again, you can make an appointment through counseling services at parkland.edu. We are using Microsoft Teams as well as a, a, a platform for, you know, tele, telehealth counseling. And we do have some availability for on-campus counseling as well. But I just want to reiterate that we're all here for you. So you may have lots of questions and concerns and how does this work? And um, we want to help you. And our, our website has lots of good information, as Mike Tremie mentioned. We have uh, FAQs, uh, again, to talk about accessibility services, counseling services, career, academic advising, counseling. So lots of good information. But whatever we can do, please reach out because we, we're here to help you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jones. And you talked about the kind of nervousness. I think one of the things we're hearing from students is that they're a little bit nervous that they're going to be, if it's online, I'm all on my own and I have to figure it out. And I think that is, is, a, is a big fear um, if you've never done online coursework before. Um, but Dr. Penny, we still have tutoring and assistance for students who, who may wanna access those services. So tell our students about what is available if you feel like I'm struggling and I'm just sitting here on my couch or at my desk and how do I figure this out? Um, what can they do? 
Yeah, absolutely. We do still have uh, the same student support services that we've always had. Our Center for Academic Success will be open. There are some safety precautions obviously happening in there. And that includes our writing center. Uh, our writing center will be mostly, I believe, online, uh, but we can get you set up with appointments for, if you need help with writing, we've got faculty who lead uh, our writing center. If you need help with math, we've got peer tutors trained, uh, peer tutors who can help you with all levels of math. Obviously, your first point of connection for support are faculty during their office hours. And the great thing now about office hours is we can do them like this. And uh, I think actually it's made, uh, I noticed that with my own students this summer, it's really made a big difference. So uh, faculty office hours, you will be available. You'll have times um, to connect with faculty. They'll let you know. Uh, we also still have our presentation center because there will still be presentations. There's still speech classes out there yes indeed and actually teams and zoom and all of these tools have really made a big difference I think for our, our speech faculty you have been particularly innovative and creative about how to integrate audience and speeches uh, so you can still do presentations online um, and so that's kind of amazing and we have a presentation center and faculty uh, staffing that so there's still a lot of help as well as our library um, there's a, the minute you log on to our library during uh, operating hours, you get a live chat immediately. So uh, you can get lots of your questions answered. There's a lot of support still at Parkland. As long as we're face to face, we have some of that face to face, but it's all available uh, online, easy to find on our website. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the speech, the speech class, you don't get off the hook in the virtual environment. <laughs> but yeah, the audience is, is now the Brady Bunch instead of a uh, students in the classroom. Um, and another barrier um, that we've heard from students, and we get this question actually from other community organizations as well, is what about technology? So to make any of this possible, you have to be connected and you have to have a device. Uh, and so in the spring, when we went to all online, we were actually able to provide checkout uh, devices uh, for students to, to use. And we've got some technology that we're making available for students to be able to connect to their coursework. And so I'll I'll uh, bounce it to Dr. Lau to talk a little bit about what we're making available for students. Yes, uh, it is very important that if, when you're taking classes and that online component that you have a computer in, in order to do this. So through our library, we can loan computers to students. They'd be laptops, they can be Chromebooks. And we also recognize that for some students, connectivity at home might not be quite good. So we do also loan out MiFi mobile hotspots, and then uh, we need power for devices, and so we can also loan out chargers. A uh, more comprehensive list of the uh, loanable technology from the library is uh, available on their website. In, a, in addition to getting devices, uh, there are also other, uh, can I say, issues with technology that sometimes students might need help with. For example, you need a password to access all the online services that we have here at Parkland. And students that need help with setting their passwords into Parkland systems or into our online learning system that we call Cobra Learning, those students that need help should contact the tech service desk. Uh, and their phone number, I'll say it here, but it's also available uh, uh, on our website is 217-353-3333. So 217-353-3333. You can get help in setting your passwords. And uh, all Parkland students have free access to the Microsoft Office Suite. And if you have any issues with installing that uh, on your own computers or on the computers that you, you loan from us, contact uh, the tech service desk. If you are needing help to get your parking email on your phone or other mobile devices, again, text service desk at 217-353-3333. They'll be able to help you. Now, when you get your password, you can access Cobra Learning for your classes. But sometimes when you get into Cobra Learning, if it's your first time, you kind of need a little bit of guidance as to how do you connect with your classes? How do you find your course content? and you can reach out to the Center for Academic Success. They are located in D120. And you can call them on the phone too, 217-353-2005. Uh, call CAS and they can help you out. 
And CAS also has uh, in D120 a range of what we call assistive technology uh, that it, uh, some students need. Uh, they learn differently and they might uh, benefit from programs that can read to them and programs that can help them improve their writing or their math. Uh, they can use that too. And then uh, because connectivity is an important thing, we have also enhanced our access to Wi-Fi connectivity from our parking lots. So students may access Parkland Wi-Fi in the parking lots of B1, C1, and C4 that you can drive up and you can get connected with Parkland Wi-Fi without having to leave your car to enter the building. Drive-in uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah, we heard that. Um, actually, some students were doing that informally in the in the spring, so we decided to make it a make it a thing, <laughs> and and actually install them outside so students can access it. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, and hopefully that helps to let some students know, hey, I could do this um, this fall if if that's going to be a challenge, um, or if they need some just a little extra uh, to make it happen. Um, so wanting to talk a little bit about campus services that will be available this fall. And one of the hot topics of the week is around athletics. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Mike Tramey to give us an update on um, what's happening with Parkland Athletics um, and also talk about our fitness center, which is a service that a lot of students do access throughout the year. Um, and they do have kind of an update on, on what their service is going to look like for the year. Yes, uh, community college athletics has, has been a, uh, a hot topic of change, as is uh, most of college athletics right now. You can't turn on a news uh, program or, or a news feed for a day without seeing a story, it seems like, lately. So um, the NJCA, which is our, our community college athletic organization, has moved all of its um, seasons to the spring. Uh, at this point in time. And so there will be no uh, on-campus competitions to go to for, for the student body um, this fall, unfortunately. But um, on the brighter side of things, as it relates to the health and wellness of our students and those taking classes that require the fitness center, we do have that facility up and running this fall. And so it may look a little different than it has in the past in terms of um, reduced hours, uh, and uh, different cleaning protocols. Um, our, our staff have worked to, to work with IDPH guidelines and, and our, our doctors uh, um, that we're in consultation with on how to do a facility like that safely. Um, we're very excited that we've gotten a handle on, on how to do that. So we will have hours in the fitness center. Um, like I said, they may be a little bit reduced, but there will, will be uh, a chunk of morning hours some afternoon or, or lunchtime type hours, and then uh, late afternoon, early evening hours, so that all students enrolled in those classes or students that are thinking about getting a membership to the fitness center this semester will have access to do so. The one biggest change will be that it will take an appointment to do those. Again, we are asking for appointments in the fitness center so we can regulate the distance between folks that are working out and that we can get those machines and equipment clean um, after their use appropriately before the next group comes in to utilize those. So um, we'll have much more information up on our website, both the FAQ page and the athletics and fitness center websites, um, as well as for those uh, students that are using the fitness center through their courses, they'll be up from their instructors in their course shells as well uh, in COBRA Learning uh, in the very near future. So keep your eyes, uh, eyes peeled for that and, and that will be uh, coming here very shortly. But, but certainly uh, you can trust that we'll have some fitness center uh, hours, at least uh, at this point in time, that is definitely our plan. Great, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Dr. Sutton, can you talk a little bit about our co-curricular venues, places like the art gallery, the planetarium, lots of places that community members know and love and may have been visiting since they were kids. Um, what's, what's going on with those venues um, for the fall semester? Well, unfortunately, um, our three beloved venues, the Gertz Gallery, Starkville Planetarium, and the Harold and G Minor Theater, along with the second stage, are currently closed to the public um, and will be until we're able to open them safely to provide the distancing and the cleaning that's needed. But that doesn't mean that you're, you have to go without your culture and your, your entertainment. Uh, all three venues have so, social media presences and they also are linking to other virtual experiences within the arts or in the sciences. 
So follow along with their Facebook pages and our website and, and kind of keep up with what's going there. Our music ensembles, which are very popular among the community, obviously many of them are too large for us to be able to safely have them practicing in any of our spaces. However, we do have three ensembles that will be still meeting. They, they're accepting students and community members now. That is the guitar ensemble, which actually is able to meet on campus. Obviously they have to wear masks, but we can distance them. And the small jazz ensemble and the choral ensemble are going to be meeting virtually. So even though we won't have live concerts, uh, you still have the opportunity to participate and hopefully maybe enjoy some of that music. And both WPCD, our radio station, and PCTV, our television station, are both fully operational, so you can enjoy all of the shows and the programming that you've always enjoyed there, and maybe even catch some of the uh, old concerts that the music ensembles have played in the past. So we'll be back strong as soon as we can. The our venues aren't going anywhere. We're just waiting until it's safe to open them again. Yeah, I feel like I want to listen in on some of those Zoom sessions. <laughs> Um, when they when they're practicing so yeah thank you it's really too bad that we're not able to have those open but it just means that we get to have a celebration when they're able to open the doors once again so that's wonderful um, talking a little bit more about student engagement because that's one of the big parts that students really miss about being virtual versus on campus um, so Dean Marietta Turner will you tell us about how student engagement activities will work for this year and what you all have planned because there's a lot more planned than um, students might think um, being in the current environment but you were able to do a lot actually. Thank you Stephanie. It's my pleasure to talk about student life because we like to say student life is where students get connected with others and have an opportunity to engage in activities, make new friends, and develop their skills and their leadership abilities. So we have a lot planned and we are basically moving things to the digital platform for them. We have not one but two weeks of Welcome Week activities planned. And we're starting it off with at first a stop by, say hi, meet our team and face to face, of course, with good social distancing and grab a sleeve of prepackaged donuts. Chance to ask questions, see if you might wanna pick up an application for student government. But the whole point of that is to let them see the space, let them meet with people and know that we're there for them. We're gonna have those two weeks of activities between August 24th and September 4th. And during those two, those two weeks, we're gonna have a lot of virtual events that will take place, including a cooking contest, a art contest, and ta-da, Parkland's Got Talent, a talent contest will allow students to show their unique abilities, win some prizes, and an opportunity to make new friends while they're at it. After that, we will have a full scale weekly package of activities that we will be notifying students about. They will get an email each week from Student Life. All students will receive it and it will have their full programming calendar. We're gonna continue the Dine and Discuss topics. Those were really a big hit last year, of course. We won't be doing them in person, but virtually, but we'll give students a chance to talk about different topics of interest. We also will have the uh, Working at Wednesday uh, series, which is a career program series, and students really did enjoy that last year. So it gives them a chance to continue to have those types of formats. We will have some opportunities to gather on campus, but it won't be as many of those. But we will have a wide range of programming on the virtual for virtual events. And we will also make sure the students have a chance to connect. We're going to make sure that we give them the opportunity to explore that which is interesting to them. So we have graphic designers, we have students who come here as wanting to be photographers, or those who wanna be writers, and they get a chance to exercise those skills and improve on them by working at the prospectus. That's our student newspaper. It's an award-winning student newspaper. And so we want students to know that we are very lucky to have several Parkland faculty who serve as advisors so that they can learn from them, gain additional skills and develop their skill sets and publish the newspaper for Parkland and the community, which will be this year only on a digital platform. But we're very excited uh, for the opportunity for the students to continue in those skill sets. Also, 
We want students to be able to be a leader. We want to develop those skill sets. And I love to talk to students who say, hey, I was in student council. I tell them student government is the place you want to be. Here's your chance to be, offer your voice, help to change uh, things that are happening on campus as a student leader, engage with others, and also um, bring about students' understanding of you have a voice as a student senator, you might end up becoming a student government president, and you could end up being the trustee. This year's student trustee was previously our student government president. So we tell students, here's a wonderful opportunity for you to grow as a leader, and we want to help you develop in that, in that realm. Also, we want students to understand that we will provide them with the tools to grow. We have student org registered student organizations, and we have students who want to develop those skill sets in those organizations, and they get to use them in practical ways. With the, what I call the pièce de résistance and the heart and the pride of student life is our new Student Leadership Academy, which has been really growing in the past year. And students will have an opportunity, even on a digital virtual platform, to engage in workshops, service learning projects, and they will in, be able to take uh, different types of projects that they can use in their classroom, in their work life, and in their own daily life to develop their leadership skills. And that, to me, is an exciting opportunity for students. Upon completion of the Student Leadership Academy, those students will be able to have an opportunity to seek a scholarship, receive a certificate of completion, and have their completion in the Student Leadership Academy noted on their Parkland's transcript. I also like to point out that getting in, into engagement is good business for students. It can help pay the bills. The perspectives and student government, as well as student leadership, uh, all offer opportunities for students to engage, learn, grow, and receive scholarships. So getting involved pays the bills. It can be very helpful. I want students to check out our webpage. We have a full calendar of our events on it, and we always update it. You will get the student email. The student email comes from Student Life. It's called Stu Life at Parkland. That's Stu, S T U Life, one word, at parkland.edu to learn more and to get involved. While we're also excited about all of the ways and opportunities for students to engage and grow while they're attending Parkland, we know that this is a, a semester that's unlike any other that they may have been involved with. So they may have some as we said, some anxiety, some personal concerns, and they may also be trying to figure out, what should I do to try to balance my busy life? Our wellness center offers opportunities for students to receive what we call Student Health 101. In the next couple of weeks, they will see information about it in their student email account. It's a monthly digital magazine with lots of tips about mindfulness. How do I juggle my life? How do I find time for good time management? How do I get some me time? It's important that students learn that this is a, it is a balancing act and we want them to be successful. So we want to give them the tools to do so. Our wellness coordinator is available uh, through the wellness center as well to answer questions students might have. I heard earlier that um, students may have absences if they're COVID related or our wellness and COVID team will be handling those. Other absences, if a student has problems or any type of situations that may cause them to be out of school for more than a couple of days, I suggest you flip over your ID. My name and my information is on the back. If you don't know what to do about a situation, I am all students advocates, reach out to me. I can help you with extended absences. I try to support and advocate for students to get to the right department, to the right dean, so that we can support them in being successful. We want students to be successful and we want them to check out Student Life because we want you to enjoy your whole experience, academic and the social. And we want you to know we're here for you. That's wonderful, Dean Turner. Yeah, actually, the, the piece on absences is great. We had a question come in on our Facebook feed on um, regarding possibly some absences. So maybe that's a resources to contact the Dean of Students if you uh, are anticipating that. 
All right. So um, one of the uh, other questions, and this is a real kind of nuts and bolts questions that are question that I'm going to um, ask of Kristen Smigelski is about books. So to get ready for classes, you have to have all the materials um, and be ready to go wherever you're doing your coursework. And so how does that work? And how do students pay for books? I feel like there's a lot of discussion about how am I, how am I going to pay for this, but there are some pretty easy ways to do that. Yes, exactly. No, it's, it's very important. You want to make sure you have everything you need um, as you prepare for the fall. So while the physical bookstore remains closed, um, the bookstore website, uh, which is a very simple website, it's parklandbookstore.com, um, will be open for online purchases of books, supplies, uh, any other course related materials that you may need. Um, so you can get those all online. Um, while you're doing that, you select a method of payment. So it's pretty open. We take debit, credit. Uh, you may use your financial aid um, or a bookstore voucher to pay for, for those books, supplies, and course-related materials. Um, when you're going through that process, students will select a method um, in which they'd like to receive those. So you can have them shipped um, at a minimal cost. We also do have a pickup window downstairs, again, on the first floor of the U-Wing. Um, at the customer service desk. So if you prefer to come in and grab your items um, that you've ordered, you may do that as well. Um, just as a quick reminder though, financial aid can be used to buy your books and supplies. Um, if your financial aid has been awarded and, and that covers all of your charges on your student account already, um, that, that uh, account, the, you will be issued um, automatically uh, a bookstore credit um, that you can use uh, to, to buy anything else that you need. So just know that that's available for you. Great. All right. So hopefully we've uh, answered the majority of questions, but if we didn't get to your question, make sure that you put it into the Q&A. We'll see them there. Um, or if you're on Facebook, you can leave information below. And I believe our, our monitors on social media also left a link. If you're if it's more of a personal question and you don't want to broadcast it to the world, we totally understand. There's a form you can submit to and we can get back to you um, individually over the next day or so and answer that question. Uh, so I have, I have one more and it's probably the burning question, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Dr. Ramage, so what are we going to do? What is Parkland going to do if circumstances change and cases rise in the community and there has to be a change midstream once again? What's our plan for that? Well, there's no room in our plan for change. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, have, we have great flexibility. Um, we're asking for flexibility. Um, our faculty, our staff um, will uh, accommodate students' needs and um, uh, barriers as best as possible. Uh, that flexibility uh, is hopefully extended to us on the student side if the, the situation changes. Uh, if we move back a phase and we're unable to bring people on campus, um, you should know that we're ready for it. Uh, we've done this before. Uh, I've been at Parkland a long time and the, the day I came in, we started working on uh, online classes and that was back in the, in the late 1990s. I'll age myself. So we've been doing it for quite a while. Our faculty, even if they, this is their first time teaching online, they're surrounded uh, by folks who've done it before. The person on the left and on the right is ready to stand in and help them. Dr. Penny and her group uh, are ready to help faculty uh, and students if they need to move back to a fully online uh, scenario. Um, should that situation arise, students should be uh, confident that we'll make every effort to help them get through to finish those courses um, you know, if there's labs or clinicals that get interrupted, we will uh, figure out a way uh, to make that uh, uh, situation better for the student uh, and to, so they can complete their courses. Um, we don't know what's coming, obviously, uh, hopefully nothing, and this goes very swimmingly all semester, but uh, in the event that it doesn't, uh, rest assured that we're, we're ready to help. Does that help? It does. The, the oh. constant is change, especially these days, but thank you, Dr. Ramage. Well, it looks like this is the end of our Q&A. We're just a couple of minutes over time. And so we, um, we've answered all the questions we can uh, for this session. But again, please leave comments um, on Facebook or submit them into the Q&A. We'd love to continue to answer those. Um, and we'd also love to see you at Parkland this fall. Um, and so thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much to our panelists for offering their time and expertise uh, to our students and their families and the community as we get ready to welcome students back. Um, here in just a couple of weeks. So thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.